The past 200 years in the West have seen staggering increases in wealth and economic opportunity. And yet, there have been no comparable increases in our level of happiness. Despite being so much richer than a few generations ago, we're often more anxious about our own importance and achievements than our grandparents were. I call this modern state of restlessness and dissatisfaction status anxiety. I want to explain where I think much of it has come from, how it affects our lives, and what I believe we could do about it. If we're surprised that being richer hasn't made us happy and secure, it's because we don't understand the psychology of satisfaction. When do we feel we have enough? What enables us to feel prosperous and content? Chiefly, a comparison with other people. But it's not good enough to compare ourselves to people who are very remote from us in time and place. It's not going to help anyone to feel very rich to be told that they have infinitely more money than one of their medieval ancestors who lived in a mud-walled cottage. We only feel content when we compare ourselves to people who are like us, our friends and colleagues, our neighbours. In short, the sense of being a success is all relative. No one spends much time resenting the Queen or Bill Gates, but we're liable to get extremely resentful if someone we think is basically just like us moves into a bigger house or gets a slightly better job. We most envy people who we take to be our equals. The modern world is based around the idea that we're all essentially equal. Not necessarily financially equal, but equal in terms of rights and opportunities. It's a lovely idea, which brings with it one nasty side effect. In a world in which you could believe that those at the top belonged to an inherently superior caste, you didn't need to feel humiliated by anything you didn't have. You might detest those who had more than you, but you didn't need to feel ashamed or anxious. But in a world in which everyone is supposed to be equal, but where there's still a lot of inequality around, it's hard not to take the achievements of others as an implicit reproach for everything you don't have and haven't done. The best place to go to understand all this is the country where the idea of equality first took hold some 200 years ago, America. Young, ready and hungry! In 1776, America had a revolution which changed the world. Help us to discover the secrets to our dream. The new democracy abolished the rigid, class-based hierarchies of Europe. You say to yourself every day, it's possible. From the first, this basic sense of equality energized America. But it also, quite unintentionally, increased Americans' anxieties about what their true place was. Their anxieties were destined to become our anxieties. The person who first and perhaps best understood the problem of modern equality was a young French aristocrat called Alexis de Tocqueville. In 1831, he came to America in order to study what he called the future shape and temperament of the world. When de Tocqueville travelled to America, the Europe he was leaving behind was still essentially an aristocratic society, run along feudal lines. This was a world in which you tended to accept the status that you'd been born into. But in America, everything was different. This was a democracy, and here you could change your status according to your luck or your talent. De Tocqueville, writing about his journey, later wrote that what he'd come to see in America was the future, and what he saw when he got there left him both impressed and frightened for all of us. De Tocqueville distills the experiences of his nine-month journey into a book called Democracy in America. It's eerie, following in his footsteps 170 years later, to see just how prescient he was. He foresaw the problems that would arise when the old social hierarchies based on class were abolished. There would be no limits to what we could legitimately expect from life. 
The Tocqueville was struck at how wealthy ordinary Americans were. They enjoyed a standard of living far superior to that of their counterparts in old Europe. But de Tocqueville noticed something else, perhaps more interesting, that despite their affluence, they constantly wanted ever more and felt great envy at anyone who had something that they didn't. chapter of his book entitled Why the Americans are often so restless in the midst of their prosperity, de Tocqueville analyzed the relationship between equality and a gnawing sense of envy. So where are we now? What's this house? This is the Delaware model. Which is? what? How does it fit into the range of, uh, of um, models? It available? is a very popular model. Um, I would say that uh, this model is on the larger end, uh, not our smallest and not our largest. And does it come with all this furniture? The young Frenchman was immediately intrigued by the houses Americans built. I was surprised to perceive along the shore a number of little palaces of white marble, several of which were of ancient architecture. When I went the next day to inspect more closely, I found that the walls were of whitewashed brick and the columns of painted wood. In the confusion of all ranks, everyone hopes to appear what he is not. And this is the, you said, the, the colonial style? Th this, this, is, this is a pretty traditional uh, two-story colonial with... Is, is that a Doric column or...? Um, those are our decorated decorator columns mm -hmm. uh, to enhance uh, the room where we put Mamera back there, which is also a decorator uh, touch. Right. De Tocqueville said, when inequality is the general rule in society, the greatest inequalities attract no attention. But when everything is more or less level, the slightest variation is noticed. That's the reason for the strange melancholy often haunting the inhabitants of democracies in the midst of abundance, and of that disgust with life, sometimes gripping them even in calm and easy circumstances. Is this real stone? That's called a non-standard option. Joni Hartley works for Washington Homes, their slogan is, making the American dream affordable. That, is that a standard piece, do you yes. know? Is that a... Oh, no, 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 Ab no, above the door, no, right. that, no, is no. A, that is a decorator right. item. Right. In a society of equals, it's natural for people to want what others have. Between 1970 and now, the proportion of Americans who defined the things in this store as necessities rose continuously. 3% in 1970 thought a second television essential. Now it's 75%. There have been equivalent increases in the numbers feeling they need the other products here at Best Buy. This relentless process from luxury to decency to psychological necessity had been noticed by de Tocqueville. He thought it explained why the Americans' greater wealth would not necessarily make them happier. The reason was that all barriers to social expectation had been removed in the United States. In America, wrote de Tocqueville, I never met a citizen too poor not to be able to glance with hope and envy at the pleasures of the rich. to a better house, get a better car, buy better clothes. Poor citizens, de Tocqueville noticed, compare themselves with rich ones and trust that they too will one day follow in their footsteps. My son wants to look just like everybody else. If they're sporting Michael Jordans, he got to sport them too. So, if I say, no, I can't get them for you, what is this child going to do? 
It's gonna go out there and rob somebody, maybe steal, kill, or whatever to get it. Some people from humble backgrounds do become very rich in America. But unlike the poor of aristocratic societies, low status Americans are prone to view their condition as nothing less than a betrayal of their expectations. <laughs> The differences between democratic and aristocratic societies came out particularly well, Tocqueville thought, in the differing mindsets of servants under the two different systems. In aristocratic societies, Tocqueville argued that servants tended to accept their fates with good grace. They didn't feel there was anything humiliating in being a restaurant manager or waiting on tables. In democratic societies, however, the atmosphere of the press and public opinion relentlessly suggested to all citizens that they could become anything on earth that they wanted to be. However, as time passed and the majority of people failed to realize their dreams, they fell prey to a kind of bitterness and a sense of despair, and the hatred of themselves and their masters grew fierce. I met Blaise Pugh at Freddy's, the restaurant where he works. Though just around the corner from the Pentagon, it has a Key West feel. But it's not where Blaze wants to be. He has set his sights on being a TV chat show host. I'm a fun person. I'm a lot of fun. I'd like to be on television every damn day. <laughs> really? Every day? Yeah. Every night? Every night. With your own show? Uh, anywhere between 9 and 11 would be fine. Well, no, 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 you can't, no, you can't sit there. Why not? Well, I need to spray it with Lysol. We had, we had a uh, naked model in here this morning who, who had her... Uh, Naked crotch on there. Why do you need to spray it? Well, She's a I don't mind. We I don't know. know where she was last night. <laughs> I, don't mind. I have an idea. Thank you very much. Blaze's agent, Dorothy, had got wind of a job for him. I rushed round. Blaze is here today to do a headshot. Um, he's got a casting call in New York next week. If they like his look, uh -huh. which we hope they do, they're looking for a character type of dude. And um, if they like him, it's a possible $40,000 job. What's your ambition, Blaze? Just to be instantly recognized. But for what? Famous for being but famous. Famous for being famous, but not necessarily for anything particular. <laughs> exactly. Great. Just famous Just for being, being famous. Character. And Dorothy, do you think that, that could happen? Do you think? Oh, absolutely. Are you guys familiar sure. with Dateline? They voted him personality of the week eight years ago. Failure's not something, it's not an option. Um, I, somebody once said to me, um, what happens if you don't fail? Well, I won't know because I'll probably be dead trying. Do your that's Sean great. Connery you did. Do Sean. That, my, that's been a couple <clears> of years It's been a while, ago. let's see. Mishmani Mish Pit? No. Mish 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 I don't know. Um, well, no. Uh, well, Mish well, Mishmani Penny. I'm, I'm so glad, you know, um, as long as the day is, you know, as long as the day is here. I look for money, Penny, wherever I can go. Well, it's, that's not You did a terrific it. job. When I next met Blaze, he proved difficult to recognize at first. Ron Com's offering 20% off today. Hello? Ron Com is having a sale, and I'm just out promoting Ron Com. Anybody got a cigarette? Ron Com's offering 20% off. Come on, give me 20% now. Let's the rigid, off, hierarchical system of almost every Western society until the 18th century was unjust in a thousand ways. Ron Com's having a sale across the street. But it did offer those on the lower rungs one notable freedom. The freedom not to have to compare their achievements with so many more successful peoples and so find themselves inadequate as a result. Ron Com's having a sale today. Do you ever think when you're doing this kind of work, do you ever sort of think, you know, maybe I should just accept that maybe I won't make it to the next level? No. And maybe I should just accept that, you know, life in the restaurant business is, is my lot. But it's not where I'm supposed to be. But do you ever despair? Do you ever just say, I should just accept, really, that what I am is a restaurant manager. I, I'm not Johnny Carson. I'm not David Letterman. I, well, I'm a no, sponge. Well, no, I can't, because I, I am. They just don't know it yet. We're all more like Blaze than we care to admit. Hello! We torment ourselves with comparisons between our lives and the lives of those a few rungs up the ladder. It obviously does not make us any happier. 
Why are we so unable to curtail our painful aspirations? Ron Cobb's having a sale across the street. It isn't just comparisons with others which stop us feeling content. It's also what we demand of ourselves. So find some reasons that can keep you strong when you want to give up. We're all now expected to succeed. Here's what I want you to repeat after me, please, with power and conviction. Say, it's possible. Les Brown is one of America's top motivational speakers. He was flying in that evening to meet me. Something about the prospect made me feel lethargic, even desperate. I said, hello, Mr. Butterball, how are you? Les, how are you? How, how, are, you? You? how are you? How are you doing now? How was your flight? Young, ready, and hungry. That's why I got into it, because I love to connect with people. Right. One of the sort of paradoxical things of watching your tapes, uh, reading your material, is that it's incredibly optimistic. But watching it has kind of made me feel that I'm kind of a loser because I haven't achieved as much as I might have done. I do that. I, I don't want you to sleep at night, particularly really? if you have not been living up to your potential. Does it frustrate you when you meet people who you feel are not living to their full potential? Oh, absolutely not. Um, when I see those kind of people, I look at them and I check them out and see what kind of physical fitness they're in. They perhaps would be very good in cleaning my house, washing my dishes, driving me around, you know, cleaning my clothes, cutting my grass. Some people choose a life of mediocrity. That's your choice. There are people who decide, I don't want to do anything but what I'm doing. I want to do drugs. I want to be an alcoholic. I want to be worthless. I want to be no good. I want to be a criminal. People make choices. But what about those people who say, I don't want to be a criminal, I want to be a chief executive, etc. but they happen to be a criminal, or they happen to be a drug addict? They don't happen to be, they have chosen to become that. So they whatever you are, whatever you are in life, you've chosen it. Wherever you are at some point in time, you made an appointment to be there. But this very tough philosophy, one could say, that actually you've been a very privileged man. Privileged? You've been a very privileged man. How so? Well, you were born into a loving family. You were born with gifts. The oh. gift for public speaking. I a know, very I, quick mind, I a very intelligent mind. These are gifts. I didn't start out like this. I was not an orator. I trained myself. I never had any college training. I saw a guy speaking and I said, hey, I think I'd like to do that. How much money have you made less? Over $37 million. In how long? 18 years. You've got to continue to work on yourself personally, to work on yourself professionally. You've got to be hungry. I think my basic feeling with Les is that he's very inspiring. Obviously, you come away from his company feeling like this is really is someone who could help you to make your life, make your millions, etc. But I suppose there remains a dark undercurrent of all this, that it raises your anxiety levels. You think, I should be so much more than I am. And in many ways, I think that life simply isn't as flexible as Les makes out. And I think that the old resignation uh, to, to one's condition is obviously negative in all sorts of ways, but it can also be quite calming. It helps you to accommodate yourself with what could be quite harsh and quite unbudgeable uh, conditions of life. So I think there's a real benefit sometimes to an approach that sees life as essentially a cruel joke. Our expectations for our lives have grown exponentially in the democratic age. A philosopher who thought deeply about what that might mean for human happiness was Jean-Jacques Rousseau, an eccentric, shrill, but unsettlingly persuasive 18th century Frenchman. Rousseau had a fascinating idea about what it is to be wealthy. Being wealthy isn't just a question of having lots of money, it's a question of having what we want. Wealth isn't an absolute, it's relative to desire. Every time we seek something that we can't afford, we can be counted as poor, however much money we may actually have. And every time we're satisfied with what we have, we can be counted as rich, however little we may actually possess. There are two ways to make people richer, reasoned Rousseau, to give them more money or to restrain their desires. Modern societies have succeeded spectacularly at the first option, but by continuously inflaming our appetites, they have at the same time helped to negate their own most impressive achievements. This analysis led Rousseau to one of his most provocative ideas, 
his concept of the noble savage. Rousseau argued that the so-called uncivilized peoples who lived in the forests, in the language of the day, savages, were not just morally better than the corrupted inhabitants of cities like Washington, D.C., they might also be happier. Modern societies might actually leave us feeling more deprived than primitive ones, where people contented themselves, in Rousseau's words, playing with crude musical instruments or using sharp-edged stones to make a fishing canoe. I think it's possibly quite easy to dismiss Rousseau's ideas as a piece of romantic fantasy. But if so many people in the 18th century took these ideas so seriously, I think it's because they had before them one stark example of many of its apparent truths in the shape of the fate of the North American Indians. Just a picture of my grandfather and my grandmother and my aunt. Warren Cook is deputy chief of what remains of the Pamunkey tribe, once led by the mighty Powhatan, king of Virginia and father of Pocahontas. This is another picture of my aunt. Uh, and I don't know why she has a gun, but probably gonna get an Englishman. Reports of Native American life from the 16th century onwards had described it as materially simple, but psychologically rewarding. Communities were close-knit, egalitarian, religious, playful, and martial. Well, we have here how the people sort of dressed and what they sort of look like. These are called John White's drawings. And then, of course, a little bit of their music and their flutes and the rattlers. So and incredibly simple instruments. Oh, of course, everything. You're, you're talking about very primitive people, of course. Within only a few decades of the arrival of the white man, the technology and luxury of European industry had awed the Native Americans. When the English came over, everything, of course, changed. The Native people wanted the thing that the English people had. Do you think before the English came, they were more or less happy with, with what they had? I mean, well, they had a very course, simple life. What's well, your sense well, of...? Well, of course they were happy. They didn't know any better. <laughs> they, they couldn't be unhappy because they didn't know what they didn't have. I once read a letter between two English merchants saying the problem with the Indian tribes is that many of them don't want enough things. And then the other merchant said, yeah, but if you try and interest them in Venetian beads, they'll love those. Well, everything was new. They would fly something new and exciting and they had never seen before. Their new possessions didn't appear to make the Indians much happier. Rates of suicide and alcoholism spiraled and communities fractured. The tribal chiefs would have known what Rousseau was talking about. How much land did the tribe have? Well, it was, is... well you can say what is just about all of Virginia. All of Virginia? Yeah, plus more. And now it's got? It's got 1,100 and some acres, that's about it. Do you think the culture they've put in this place, I mean, we drove through on the way here, through endless uh, strip malls, Walmart, you know, KFCs, all these big brands, that's the culture that's replaced the native American culture. And what, what do you think of the new American culture? You got 10 times more things to be anxious about now. What, what are we anxious about now? We, we anxious about everything. You know, we got all these psychological problems. We got Prozac right. kids, Prozac women, but, but in the Prozac old Nick, men. But surely there is. Sure. Well, you lost maybe just a simpler type of life without the anxiety. The Indians ceased listening to the quiet voices that spoke of the modest pleasures of community and of the beauty of the empty canyons at dusk. And that, thought Rousseau, was what we'd all done. I get angry when you read about it. <laughs> you right. know, you go back and kind of relive yeah. what, they, what the poor people went through. I get, I get mad at that. When you, you, when you meet an English person now, you, you feel angry or you forgive them? 
your English? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm asking nervously. Would you uh, like to swim? Do you like uh, to swim? <laughs> you gonna throw me in? <laughs> was an American psychologist, William James, who first explored from a psychological angle the particular problems that societies create for themselves when they start raising huge expectations in their citizens. And James illustrates this kind of fascinating dynamic between expectations and fulfillment in a kind of theory that he writes. He says that our self-esteem, that thing that we're all searching for, self-esteem, is the result of two things, success the number of things that we're successful at over expectation, the number of things that we expect to be successful at. And really what he's saying by this is that in order to have high self-esteem, you can do two things, either become more successful or lower the number of things that you expect to be successful at. And the problem, James says, of modern American societies and also Western European is that they're constantly placing us under huge pressures to succeed. They're constantly raising the level of our expectations, and in so doing, they're making self-esteem a very elusive thing indeed. Every rise in our levels of expectation entails a rise in the risks of humiliation. And if we do fail, how much sympathy can we expect from other people when the system seems bent on removing every excuse we might have for our failures? Trying to survive, trying to make it, you know, just working hard, trying to provide for my kids, trying to keep a, a nice home over their head and make sure, because in our society today, it's hard. Move into a better house, get a better car, buy better clothes, and then when God gets finished, tell him to give you the mic and let you testify. Things will never have a, that big, big house I see in the TV. <laughs> You've got to decide to be relentless. You've got to decide never to give up. You gotta be hungry. If you're rich, you rich. If you're poor, you're poor. It's not, you know, you know, and then if you're in between, you gotta strive to stay where you're at or, the, or you're gonna fall under. God is sick and tired of his people looking like lemons in the face. He wants you to enjoy your life. I worry about my safety, you know, I'm a young black man. Most young black males either dead or locked up. You know, that's horrible. I don't want to have to worry about that. You know what I mean? That's, that's not living to me. That's not living at all. You know? See, the only time, a lot of times I would be able to get on camera is if I was coming out of court. You know what I mean? Or something else. You speak to those other African Americans, Civil War Memorial. Doors open that side. No country embodies the meritocratic ideal like America. It is, we're constantly being told, a wide open country where anyone who works hard can succeed. This constant striving can disturb the mental calm of people who are, to all intents and purposes, rich. But it has also changed their attitudes towards the poor. Of course, America isn't a meritocracy. You only have to look around you to see that the system is weighted in favor of certain groups and massively weighted against others. You only have to remember the issue of race. Yet the key point is that Americans perceive that their society is in fact meritocratic. And there's a cruel logic to the whole idea of a meritocracy. Because if you genuinely believe that those at the top merit their success, you have to believe that those at the bottom must merit their failure. Jenny Lamont begs by the side of the road to feed her two children. What do you think when you see people like her? Do you think they've been unlucky? Or do you tend to assume that they have in some way brought it on themselves, that they're losers even? I think a lot of the middle class people and people that have money, yeah, they look down on you. When rich people come, they'll be rolling their windows up or they won't even pull their car up next to you. They don't want to have anything to do with you. So who are the people who help you most? Mexicans, 
Indian women and a lot of women. And why do you think that is? Because they, they've been there and they know that you wouldn't be out there if you didn't need it. Thank you so much, ma'am. God bless you. Thank you. You have a nice day, ma'am. Thank you. So my husband much. and I were together for 26 years. And my husband recently died. I, I was a bookkeeper for a small company. I worked there seven years. And um, I lost my job. I came home from work. He was in a coma on the couch. Called the ambulance. Um, they took him to the hospital. He died not, uh, September 11th, uh, 02 of the year anniversary of the plane crash. And um, I went into a real bad depression because I was still at my job at that time. And at that point, you, you lived uh, in a nice house? I had my own, own apartment, three-bedroom apartment. But it, I couldn't pay the rent, so I just recently got evicted. And I have to be out on the 13th of this month. So where are you living now? My father-in-law has let me stay in his basement. Well, when you need to feed your kids, you do anything. It's very degrading going out there, but it's, it's how I feed my kids. So I, I don't care what the people said to me, or if they yelled at me, or anything. Thank you so much, ma'am. God bless you. Thank you so much. Uh, they don't know my story, so they don't know what's going on in my life. Are you surprised by what's happened to you when you look back on your life? Are you, are you shocked? How do you, how do you, how do you think about what's happened to you? I try not to because I get depressed, you know, because I, everything I had it was great. My life was great. And I kind of lost it like within a month, everything was gone. From the middle of the 19th century, especially in the United States, perceptions of the relative virtues of the poor and the wealthy began to change. The possession of money began to seem less like a fortunate blessing and more like proof of moral superiority. I felt a bit nervous about meeting Grover Norquist. He's one of Washington's most prominent neoconservative lobbyists. Can you make sure the front desk does not put calls through? So what do you see as the most fundamental ideas about American society and econ the economy? Well, it based the United States from day one, was founded on the basis that anybody could do and be anything he wanted to. Didn't matter who your parents were, didn't matter what they did. Uh, that you were in charge of your own future. There's no ceiling uh, and there's no floor. Uh, you want to be a bum, you can be a bum. You want to uh, accomplish great things, you can do that, it's up to you. Uh, the state's responsibility is to provide for a free and open and just society uh, to execute murderers and uh, otherwise leave people alone. Why uh, shouldn't the state help the needy? Uh, because to do that you would have to steal money from people who earned it and give it to people who didn't. Uh, and then you make the state into a thief. Why is it theft? To take money that you didn't earn? Uh, to... Could you give me one second? Could... Damon! Damon! Whatever you're doing, shouting over there, it comes right through the <clears> walls. <throat> Could you make sure people are quiet, because we're getting noise louder than just talking noises through the walls. You're suggesting that taxation is theft? Taxation beyond the uh, legitimate requirements of providing for justice is theft, sure. It strikes me that there's a lot less guilt towards the underprivileged in American society compared to in European society. Why do you think that might be? If you believe that somebody's property and wealth is not necessarily legitimately earned because he's an earl or a duke or he got it from his great-great-great-great-grandfather who stole it from the Normans or the Saxons or something. Um, well, then wealth, in the Proudhon, property is theft. And in Europe, a lot of property was theft. <laughs> okay. um, in the United States, because we take so many immigrants, it's a little hard to argue that you can't succeed when you see you know, five-year-old Cambodian children coming out of the uh, killing fields of Cambodia becoming the, the, the best speller in the country at age 12. Okay, that person could do it, and you're telling me that you can't get out of bed in the morning and go to work because life is unfair? Do you think it's nicer to be poor in Europe 
than it is in the United States. Nicer. Um, I don't know, maybe less dignity if the government's willing to do more for you. When people give you money for not working, it's destructive of human dignity and eventually destructive of human liberty. It turns people into lazy folks who don't want to accomplish anything and just sort of sit around. Why would you want to have anything to do with that? I don't believe in the American dream. You know, I really don't. I think that's just words, you know? In America, it became possible for the first time to argue that the rung of the ladder each person stood on accurately reflected their true qualities. Conveniently for the successful, this reduced the need for welfare, redistribution of wealth, or even simple compassion. Given this relentless logic, voices like Grover's will only grow louder. Damon! If you met someone who was very successful in every way, had lots of fame, money, respect, and you asked them why they were successful, and they said, well, it's just good luck, you'd think they were being unduly modest. Similarly, if you met someone who was a failure in every way, no job, no money, no respect, and you asked them what had happened, and they said it was just bad luck, you'd think they were trying to hide something. Essentially, luck has disappeared as a plausible explanation for what happens to people in their life. Winners make their own luck is the punishing modern mantra. And yet, for all our unwillingness to put much faith in luck, we are, in important ways, more at the mercy of forces beyond our control than ever before. The globalized economy has brought great rewards to its winners but it's also constantly creating large numbers of losers. In traditional societies, high status and the respect it brings may have been inordinately hard to acquire, but they were also pleasantly hard to lose. Modern societies have sought to make status dependent on achievement, primarily financial achievement. But the nature of the economy that those societies have created is making that achievement ever more precarious. Bethlehem Steel, outside Baltimore, was once the largest steelworks in the world. Now, all but one of its furnaces lie rusting, its workforce down from 32,000 to 2,000. Joe Rizel has worked there all his professional life. You know, there's always been a sense of pride in the steel industry. A lot of the uh, people in the steel industry are patriotic. People were, uh, you know, enlisted in the army. We were doing a lot of work that would, you know, built American people knew that. I thought I'd be able to retire here like my father. My fa I'm a second generation. My father worked right here in this mill. We're on a slippery slope now. We could be here today, gone tomorrow. We just don't know. There's a lot of uncertainty. For most of us, our work is the chief determinant of the amount of respect and care we will be granted. The globalized economy is making that work more unstable, opening up an anxiety-inducing gap between what we need and what the world will give us constant pressure from uh, imported steel coming into the country has made uh, these jobs very precarious in terms of are they going to last? Are you going to be able to get to your retirement? Are you going to get your pension or not? No matter what it seems that we do to make ourselves more productive, and we are more productive than we've ever been, it never seems to be enough. Does all this make you more sad or more angry? I'm more angry than sad, but I the, the anger is, is towards people saying there's uh, free trade and uh, fair trade when I know that there's not. The sadness is, you know, seeing an industry that doesn't have to be destroyed, be destroyed over time by the globalization of trade with no plan on how that should be done. Just having chaos reign. We seem determined to remove any excuse we might point to for failure, just when more and more of us are less secure in our jobs than ever. I'm interested in the consolation still available to the unsuccessful 
when the world doesn't give them the respect that they need. Move into a better house. Get a better car. Buy better clothes. And then when God gets finished, tell him to give you the mic and let you testify. Over the course of the 19th century, many Christian thinkers, especially in the United States, began to change their views of money and worldly success. Increasingly, in a departure from traditional Christian thought, American Protestant denominations have suggested that wealth might be a reward from God for holiness. Make money your friend. Touch your neighbor and say, make money your friend. Make money your friend. Make all the money you can. Our friend at Tocqueville also noticed this new American tendency for Christianity to align itself with the materialist values of the rest of the culture. The evangelical mission, he said, appears here to be an industrial enterprise. Bishop Jimmy Ellis III founded the Victory Christian Center in a rundown Philadelphia neighborhood in 1983. His congregation now numbers 1,600. We need to learn how to become friends with money. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might be rich. And that's not spiritual riches there. People try to make it spiritual. It's not spiritual. The whole chapter is talking about money. So let me try and understand. So Jesus became poor. Yes. So that we can become rich on earth. That's right. Sunday morning in Levington, Suffolk, England. For centuries, all across the West, people have been coming to services like this. On offer has always been the consoling reminder that there might be more important things in life than status and success. The very fact that we still retain a distinction between wealth and virtue and ask of people whether they're good rather than simply important is in large part due to the impression that Christianity has left on Western consciousness. For Jesus Christ's sake, our only mediator and advocate. It's become rather unfashionable to take Christianity all that seriously, in Britain at least. And yet the fact that we don't may be a major cause of our modern status anxieties. We've largely lost the Christian sense that there is no necessary connection between a person's value and their status in the world. For Christians, Jesus had been the highest man, the most blessed, and yet on earth he had been a humble carpenter, ruling out any simple equation between a person's status and their position in heaven. It's worth dwelling on just how much consolation there must have been in that very simple idea. You can't tell me nothing about this subject because I was poor, but I bless God I ain't poor now. I didn't have no bank account, but I thank my God that I followed him. I thank God. I know what God can do for you if you just follow and obey him. In the City of God, written in AD 427, in the closing years of the Roman Empire, the theologian Saint Augustine explained that all human actions could be interpreted from either a Christian or a Roman perspective. The very things esteemed so highly by the Romans, amassing money, building villas, winning wars, counted for nothing in the Christian outlook. St. Augustine urged Christians to replace Roman values with a new set of concerns, loving one's neighbors, practicing humility and charity, and recognizing one's dependence on God. Practicing those values offered the key to elevated Christian status. Over coffee and biscuits at Ian and Margaret Angus's, Canon Geoffrey Grant explained. How can you tell if someone is spiritually rich? Is that connected to um, if someone's you know, got quite a lot of income? Not necessarily, no, I, I, I don't think so at all. Do you think that the Lord rewards people who are good with riches? Absolutely, 
Absolutely. I mean, if someone's got a, a very nice car, a very, isn't, doesn't that show that God thinks that this person's quite good? Uh, I don't think so. You get uh, a classic example is Mother, Mother Teresa. Jesus Christ came in order to make us abundant so that we wouldn't have to live in poverty, that we wouldn't have to live in lack. And that is part of the new covenant that he provided. So there might be uh, people here who've got very little money, but they're very rich but spiritually. Rich, rich spiritually, and that comes out when they come to church. And when you talk to them, uh, they are pillars of the village, and they'll go around and spend their whole lives looking after their neighbors. On the whole, if you saw, you know, 100 rich people and 100 poor people, would you, in a way, if you had to make a choice, would you say that it, the richer group was the holier group, not just rich, but also holy, and that the poor group was in a way maybe the more sinful group. No, I would not advocate that at all. I would not advocate that at all. Um, because riches is not an indication of holiness. But before you said it, it was. Excuse me? You, you did no, say I said that's a part of it. I was very clear that it's a part of the blessing of God. But you don't have to be rich in order to be holy. Because many rich people are not holy. And many poor people are not holy too. So, so the riches itself is not holiness, no. So, so what overall could we say about riches? I mean, is riches a sign of holiness or isn't it? I mean, if you had to make a sort of generalization. R riches is a byproduct of walking with God. Jeffrey, what's your own attitude towards wealth uh, for, for yourself? Uh, my car, for instance, is 16 years old. Why don't you get a newer one? Really, because I haven't been able to afford it. And I'd rather have the, the car I know than buy a, a second-hand car. So it doesn't really matter to you what car you drive? Uh, no, I, I, I don't, as long as it goes and is reliable. And perhaps that's what God thinks about us. The Bible does not say money is the root of all evil. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. And you can have plenty of it and don't love it. And the key to that is being generous. How many of the Lord is so good, amen? Hallelujah! 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 Coming to hear Bishop Ellis here in Philadelphia, I think what's striking for me is to realize just how much Christianity has been readapted to fit a new American model, to fit the idea of the American dream. And I think what's particularly striking, perhaps to someone coming from Europe, is just how much that consoling message, the traditional message of Christianity, that you could both be poor and spiritually rich, has been lost. And that, I think, is a very troubling lesson indeed. Until the late 19th century, it was the spires of churches and cathedrals which dominated the skyscape of every town and city in the West. City dwellers engaged in worldly tasks could remind themselves of a vision of life which challenged the authority of ordinary ambitions. There's no doubt that it's worldly values that have now triumphed over spiritual ones. And there's one aspect of this decline in Christian belief with particular implications for status anxiety. In an age which could believe that what happened to you on earth was but a brief prelude to what might happen in the next life, the pressure to succeed and fulfill yourself would inevitably be lessened. But in a secular age in which the whole idea of an afterlife has become increasingly unbelievable, the pressure to succeed in this life has inevitably heightened. What you achieve right now in your own life is all that you will ever be. No wonder we're slightly more worried. Everyone is searching to be somewhere. Everyone's looking to be somewhere. Everyone's going out of the way to be someone. So basically, everyone's looking for a status. You know, everyone's looking for a better job, a better education. You know, a better way of life, so it's all about status. We look for rewards in terms of promotion, in terms of money, in terms of buying a nicer house. For most of us, the reward we really want is attention. It's terribly boring to be ignored. And I think this is part of the joy and part of the game of contemporary life, isn't it? We, you know, we're, we're constantly classing others and constantly judging others. And once you start being aware that gestures have meaning, objects mean things, there's no escaping it. 
I want to explore how those anxieties affect almost every aspect of our everyday lives. We worry about being made redundant and how it will affect the way others see us. We worry about being passed over for promotion. We worry about being kept waiting. We worry about our colleagues and even close friends doing better than us. Of course, what gives a person status in a given society keeps changing. Throughout history, people have been awarded high status for a wide variety of things. In ancient Sparta, to have high status, you needed to be warlike, aggressive, bisexual and good at spearing enemies. Among the Inuit, the highest status people were those who could harpoon fish and seals. In 18th century Britain, you needed landed wealth, horses, a languid elegance and a polished after-dinner dancing technique. Whilst in the 21st century, it's fashion, business, sport, or all three. Though the way that high status is earned may have changed throughout history, the consequences of high status are familiar from really any time or society, and they come down to being treated well, to being treated with respect, and even, you could say, a kind of love. Just as romantic lovers will enjoy the care and attention of those who love them, so too those with high status will enjoy the care and attention of the world. It's common to assume that the worst thing about low-paid work is the money, just as the money is the best thing about highly paid work. But there's another way of looking at the issue, a way that puts status at the heart of the subject. One could argue that what makes low-paid work really distasteful is the way that one is treated. It isn't the money per se, it's the lack of status involved. Many low-paid jobs leave us treated as if we didn't properly exist. No one cares who we are and what we think. We're machines for performing a simple task, not humans with as rich and as complex an identity as anyone in a boardroom. Conversely, Part of what keeps people working, even once they've made a lot of money, is the respect they receive from others. They're looked up to, esteemed, and sometimes photographed on their way to the shops. Strada is a chain of restaurants owned by a 30-something multimillionaire, Luke Johnson, who made his fortune selling a chain of pizza restaurants. Luke could have retired a long time ago, but he decided to keep working. I think we are all, in a way, trying to prove ourselves to some audience or another. I remember once reading a survey amongst businessmen or business people, men and women, and um, it was trying to tap into the motivations as to why they were in business and why they continue to strive for success even after they've achieved a certain amount. And um, the single phrase that summed it up in a very short sense was, I'll show them. And I think an awful lot of people, perhaps in their past, have a school teacher who put them down, or perhaps a parent who said, you'll never amount to anything. Someone who criticized them or didn't believe in their potential. So I think for a lot of people, it's about proving the skeptics wrong. One of the people who first analyzed how we often want money for the status it gives us more than anything else was the great Scottish philosopher Adam Smith. There's a revealing passage in his book, The Wealth of Nations, where he bluntly asks what the rat race is all about. What is all the toil and bustle for? What are people aiming at with their ambitions and their frenzied pursuits of wealth, power and preeminence? Are they looking to supply their basic needs? No, the wages of the poorest laborer can supply those. What then are they after? They want to be treated well. They want to be attended to, to be taken notice of with sympathy, kindness, and approval.
One of the things that makes Adam Smith such a central figure in the history of his subject is his analysis of the reasons why people are accumulating wealth and his emphasis on the fact that they're doing this because they want dignity and respect, not just fancier clothes or bigger houses. Jean. Jean. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Have a How are you? <laughs> this is Alina. Hi. Jean. 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 What was the name of the guy who had uh, one eye? Oh, Boddington. 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 Few things trigger status anxiety more powerfully than school reunions. This is Haywards Heath School. People gathering here left 30 years ago. It can be agonizing to compare ourselves to people who were once our equals. More specifically, to have to hear of their success. Plenty would agree with Gore Vidal's line. Every time a friend of mine succeeds, a small part of me dies. Why did I dress like this? Why didn't I come in jeans like it was this afternoon? Why didn't I wear clothes that were much more relaxed or even maybe a T-shirt with some political statement on it? And, and that is very interesting to me. And I think there is a certain status, if I dress well, then chances are people are going to see me maybe as a little more successful. Or at least they're going to see me as somebody who is at least reasonably clean shaven and looks after himself and, and, and has some basic manners. Why do we care so much about having status? Perhaps because our self-esteem is so dependent on the esteem in which we're held in by others. It's as if we suffer from a congenital uncertainty as to our value, growing confident in ourselves when others value us and losing confidence in ourselves when we're ignored. The great American philosopher and psychologist William James went so far as to suggest that if we were completely ignored by everyone we came across, it would feel worse than being tortured. Whilst writing his book, The Principles of Psychology, at Harvard in 1890, James got many of his insights from simply interrogating himself. He noticed how differently he felt on days when he'd been greeted warmly and admired by people, and days when he was ignored and on his own. What really impressed William James was just how much the views of others influence our sense of ourselves. It seems as if a whole identity is held captive by the judgments that people around us have of us. If they laugh at our jokes, we develop a sense that we're funny. If they praise us, we develop an impression of high merit. But if they ignore us when we walk into a room or lose interest in us after we've revealed our occupation, we're liable to fall into feelings of self-doubt and worthlessness. There's a part of the child in all of us. What do babies need to thrive? A stark study was made about this in Austria in the 1940s. Two sets of babies were tracked, who both had identical and excellent material care. But one set of babies was looked after by loving, smiling mothers, the other by faceless nurses in a huge state-of-the-art orphanage. It was found that those who were looked after anonymously had severe development problems. The death of some orphans was even ascribed by doctors to nothing less than a lack of sustained attention. We look for rewards in terms of promotion, in terms of money, in terms of buying a nicer house. For most of us, the reward we really want is attention from whoever it is you're working for. And if you ask yourself, who am I working for? Who do I want to notice how well I'm doing? Is it my partner? Am I still trying to please my own father? Is it my mother? Is it the children whom I want still to see me as, you know? Um, it, it's sometimes quite interesting to work out for yourself because you will find, I think, everybody will always find that they are actually looking for somebody's attention and approval. I think we want to feel secure 
about the people we love and who love us more than we want anything else in the world, including to win a million on who wants to be a millionaire. If you said to somebody who wants to win a million or who wants to be entirely secure in their love relationships, sexual and non-sexual, I think I know what the answer would be. So that's what we're looking for, security, a feeling of being safely loved and it not being risky. Just like babies, we need those small signs of care and attention that we capture with the word love. Without this love, we may not die, but we will end up anxious and sad. You could say that there are two kinds of love that we search for throughout our lives. Romantic love and love from the world. Romantic love is familiar enough. It's the stuff of every novel, love song and magazine article. But our search for love from the world is no less intense. But it tends to be spoken of in rather shameful, caustic terms, as though this was something that only a deficient or an envious soul would be interested in. But far from it, our search for status is linked to something that is as essential to us as light, heat, food and water. Once we work out how central the need for love is, a lot of things become clearer. From why we go shopping to why we sometimes kill one another. Much of the reason why we go shopping is unconnected to any urgent material need. We often shop in order to persuade the world that we are worthwhile, interesting people. We often shop for emotional rather than practical reasons. A lot of consumption is about acquiring status symbols, material objects whose primary use is psychological. They are objects that signal to the world that we are worthy of dignity and respect. This is the home of Stephen Bailey, a style consultant who worked for many years with Terence Conran and an expert on why we buy designer goods. I'm not certain objects make us more lovable, but they certainly make us more interesting. I mean, knowing I was going to be talking to you today, I made a very conscious decision about which of five wristwatches I should wear, and I was very you know, perhaps some would say anxious about what your expectations might be, because I thought you'd be thinking I'd put a Rolex on. And instead, I've chosen a particularly obscure form of antique watch with a brown ostrich strap. Um, now, I, I'm not a, I suppose to some people this is the most monstrous form of affectation, and it, they're, they're probably right. But I, I find it absolutely fascinating that the mere application of a, you know, of, a, of a device to one's wrist can entirely change you know, one's style and the way in which other people interpret me. I'm acutely aware of the, the status messages which objects convey, and I remember some years ago going through a particularly sort of philosophically trying ordeal with a fountain pen. And you know, because of the way I see the world, I've always been anxious just to acquire, you know, the simplest and best table, you know, the simplest and best whatever, chair, watch, whatever. I had identified a particular brand of fountain pen as, and I write a lot, so I, pens are quite important to me personally, I had identified this sort of fountain pen as the ultimate of its kind. So I saved up and I, you know, I bought one and I loved it. And then, to my horror, I found this hitherto exclusive and rare device uh, was becoming more and more popular. And I remember going through this terrible, terrible moment of self-examination, thinking, should I now, now that my revered fountain pen has become popular, should I hide it away and not use it? And ultimately I decided, no, the best thing to do was actually, actually just bash on, you know, and brave it, because I thought it was, um, I thought it ultimately it was more arch to hide it away. The man responsible for the term status symbols was the American sociologist Thorstein Veblen, who wrote a wonderfully witty, even bitchy book called The Theory of the Leisure Class in 1899. Having observed the rich at leisure near his home in Connecticut, 
he became fascinated by how people acquire certain luxury goods to symbolize their high status. Many clothes were deliberately designed to show that the people wearing them didn't need to work, indeed couldn't possibly do so in something so impractical. People are often mocked for their interest in luxury goods, luxury cars or clothes, and they're described as being greedy for wanting these things. But I think that's to miss an emotional subtlety of the whole subject. People are attracted to status symbols principally because they want to feel valued. Most modern cars are very efficient in getting you from A to B. So if there's a continuing appetite for so-called luxury cars, the reason typically has little to do with engineering, ABS brakes and satellite communication. It has to do with wanting to be treated nicely. What's special about this car? Well, we're in an environment, it's a very nice place to be. I mean, looking at the, looking at the dash as a whole, uh, you, you've got acres of walnut wood, um, a stitched leather top of dash. We also have a feature in here called active seats, which will massage your uh, posterior for long journeys to make sure you don't get an unbum. iDrive controls the display panel that you look at in the center. It has uh, the facility to control the navigation system in the vehicle, mm -hmm. so you're able to dial up uh, at your front door, wherever you want to go, by road name and house number to, to that detail, right. uh, and it will take you there. What's the, in the tray below? The tray below is, uh, is your ashtray. Right. Even I have one of those. <laughs> Even you have one of those. Tell me, what will owning a car like this do for you as a person? It would be wrong to sort of compartmentalise owners of cars, um, but certainly this car is going to say a lot about you. Uh, that the visual appearance of the car uh, is a strong, muscular appearance to the car. It, it has a lot of purpose to it. I think owning a car like this gives you a tremendous amount of confidence. Perhaps it's those who strive hardest to be successful who are most haunted by feelings of failure. Scratch the surface of almost anyone who's made it to the top of their chosen field and you'll find an unusually vicious fear of being a loser. After all, what need would there be to be so impressive if it wasn't for a fear of being the opposite? There's a sad, emotionally deprived side to upmarket car sales. Rather than a tale of greed, the history of luxury goods could, I think, more accurately be read as the record of emotional trauma. It's the legacy of people who felt pressured by the insensitivity of others to impress them through the use of material objects. And that really places the onus for what's going on in the world of luxury goods, not just on the buyers, but also on their audience. Because I think it's an uncomfortable, but very true fact that the amount of love that you receive from the world is dependent upon the number of status symbols that you can wield. Signs of how much we crave respect don't only lie in our appetite for shopping. They also lie in our extreme touchiness about whether or not we're being taken seriously. A touchiness that can lead people to challenge each other to fights and even fatal duels to prove themselves. From its origins in Renaissance Italy until its end in the First World War, the practice of dueling claimed the lives of hundreds of thousands of people the world over status was a matter of honour. The reasons for challenging someone to a duel were often petty in the extreme. In Paris in 1878, one man killed another who had described his apartment as tasteless. In Florence in 1902, a literary man ended the life of a cousin who'd accused him of not understanding Dante. And in France, under the regency of Philippe d'Orléans, two officers of the guard fought over the ownership of an Angora cat. <laughs> Dueling symbolizes a radical incapacity to believe that our status could be our business, something that we decided and then didn't change according to the shift in the views of our audience. The dueler, what other people make of him, is the only factor in settling what he can think of himself. 
He can't continue to remain acceptable in his own eyes if those around him think him a fool or an effeminate, a, a liar or an idiot. He'd rather die by a bullet or a stab wound rather than let unfavorable ideas about him remain lodged in the public mind. Even though dueling may have gone out of fashion, many disputes and lawsuits continue to be fights about status. 22-year-old Damien Cope became involved in a confrontation after telling a gang member to put away a gun because there were women and children about in a park in South London. On Burgess Park that day, there was a notorious gang member, and for whatever reason, he felt that Damon disrespected him. He has a, a confrontation with Damon in Gangthon. That's what um, a gang member has a confrontation with you. Um, he produces and lets Damon see he has a weapon. And Damon disrespected him by telling him to put the weapon away and fight him on a one-to-one, -one, and the best man to walk away. And for that, Damon gave himself serious problems. The consequences are then there's a standoff. This person's going to get it. I really remember the last time I looked at the clock, it was 9.30, and I had fell asleep. And the next thing I knew was the phone was ringing, and it was Fiona, Damien's girlfriend, and she was screaming down the phone, Damien's been shot. I jumped up, and I said, what? She said, Damien's been shot. Felt suddenly very weak, and, like, something had been zapped from me. It was like I felt Damien leave. I felt him leave my, my body because I carried this child for nine months. I grew him for 22 years. And as his mother, I felt him leave. We eventually got to the UCH. Joanne, the nurse, and two armed police officers were coming towards the entrance. And um, I knew by her face what she was going to say. And she just nodded her head and said, I'm so sorry, he's gone. And I said, please take me to Damien, please. I'm begging you, take me to my son. She took my hand and she took me down a corridor. And I saw my child laying there and I hugged him. I asked him why, why, why somebody had shot him. What did he do so bad for somebody to take your life? Damien Cope's death is a shocking example of the consequences of a dispute about status. Very few of us pick up guns when we're insulted, but the feeling of vulnerability to others' view of us is sadly only too common. It's worth asking why this anxiety about status should nowadays be worse than it's ever been in history. Living standards in the West have hugely improved in the last 200 years. There have been major increases in life expectancy, economic opportunity and wealth generally. And yet despite these improvements, it's possible to argue that we're today much more status conscious and status anxious than we ever were in the days of lords and ladies and horse-drawn carriages. And for a reason why, we should travel back to history and there we'll see that for all their many disadvantages, old societies had one big advantage when it came to status. Before the middle of the 18th century, status tended to be handed out in very particular ways. Firstly, it mattered not what you did, but who you were, who your parents were, what kind of background you had. Consequently, there was real cynicism about the character of those at the top of society. They weren't necessarily the best, they were those who'd been handed their privileges on a plate. Secondly, there was very little social mobility. You tended to stay where you were. And thirdly, a related point, people tended to have very low expectations of the kind of life that they could have. Under the old feudal system, only a very few had ever aspired to wealth and fulfilment. The majority knew well enough that they were condemned to exploitation and resignation. The 
working classes were considered creatures lacking in reason and therefore naturally fitted to leading dismal lives as beasts of burden were to tilling fields. The notion that inequality was fair, or at least irrevocable, was often shared by the oppressed themselves. With the spread of Christian teachings during the later Roman Empire, many fell prey to a religion that taught them to interpret their unequal treatment as part of a natural and unchangeable order. In his book, Polycraticus of 1159, the English medieval philosopher John of Salisbury became the most famous Christian writer to compare society to a body and to use the analogy to justify a system of natural inequality. In Salisbury's account, every part of a state could be compared to a part of an individual human body. So the ruler was rather like a head, the parliament like the lungs, the treasury like the stomach, the army like the hands, and the working classes in general like the feet, with the peasantry in particular being compared to the toes. Behind this admittedly rather insulting metaphor lay the idea that everyone in society had been accorded an unalterable role. According to the old class system, to ask why some people were allowed to feast in banqueting halls while others were condemned to tilling the soil was an impossible question, almost as impossible as to ask whether God really existed. In the old status system, you either had status or didn't, and if you didn't, there wasn't much you could do about it. The old system was patently unfair. Then gradually, in the middle of the 18th century, a new way of distributing status emerged, a way that gave hope to millions of people and dramatically changed their lives, but at the same time, a way that brought a new level of anxiety to the lives of many. The new system was called meritocracy. I travelled to America to look at how the creation of the United States in 1776 fundamentally changed the way status was distributed. The constitution of this new country was based on an idea that would come to affect almost every aspect of life right across the modern Western world, the idea of meritocracy. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Those words were first drafted by Thomas Jefferson in June 1776. In his autobiography written at the end of his life, Jefferson explained that he had spent his career trying to create what he called an aristocracy of talent to replace the old aristocracy of privilege and, in many cases, of brute stupidity. He believed in the infinite perfectibility of every person. Talent belongs to everyone, he wrote. It is as much a part of a man as his arm or his leg. It belongs to everyone, to a greater or a lesser extent. From the early 19th century onwards, American bookshops grew filled with autobiographies of self-made heroes and compendia of advice directed at the not yet made morality tales which told of wholesale personal transformation and the rapid attainment of great wealth and immense happiness. The growth of the mass media helped ordinary Americans to start dreaming that they could one day have the same kind of life as the high-status people they read about. Ladies Home Journal, Cosmopolitan and Vogue brought an expensive life within the imaginative reach of all. With enough talent, anyone could do anything. Good morning, everybody. It is 8.30 and time to be in class. Would you please stand for our Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible. With liberty and justice for all. We need to have a moment of silence, please. This is Jefferson High School, just outside Washington, D.C. 
the pupils here are imbued with the ideals of meritocracy on a daily basis. Thank you and have a great day. This American ideal doesn't, of course, involve a search for equality, merely an initial period of strictly policed equal opportunity. If everyone has had the same chance to go to school and enter university and sit exams, then, so the idea goes, there will be perfect justice in any aristocracy that subsequently emerges among Americans. The students here really are taught that they could become anything that they wanted in life, that if they work hard enough, if they believe in themselves enough, they can achieve anything. It's an immensely moving idea, one that you can feel energizes the whole of a school like this. Every person of school age who enters this nation, no matter what their background, is welcomed into a school. And our public school system uh, is that system that has open doors for uh, every person. So you need not be of a certain economic group, ethnicity, geography, if you are living in the United States, even if you're an illegal immigrant, you're entitled to go to our schools, which is an awesome undertaking and very difficult. In some of my schools, we have taken in young people who have actually come straight out of the jungle. And they're maybe 15 years old, and they have never been in a school in their life. They are literally illiterate. They do not read or write the language that they speak. And then we, of course, immerse them in English. Do you think the United States is a genuine meritocracy? We strive to be. It is an eternal goal, yes. Do you want your class to win money? Of course you do. Penny Wars is going through Thursday of this week. Put pennies in your class's locker and put other types of coins in other classes' locker. Take away from their total. The winning class will be announced on J-Day. That would be the end of your morning announcements. Have a great day. The American dream it took a long time to filter back to the motherland. As late as the 1930s, over 150 years after the American Revolution, the English writer George Orwell complained that Britain was a country still filled with inequality, corruption and injustice. But there was about to be a new pressure for change. What we need now in Britain is a revolution against class privilege. We need to fight against the notion that a half-witted public schoolboy is better at his job than an intelligent mechanic. Although there are gifted and honest individuals among them, we have to break the grip of the old aristocracy. England has to assume its real and just shape. In March 1936, George Orwell came to Wigan in Lancashire and spent two months here. He was appalled by the poverty that he saw all around him. But what appalled him even more were what he felt to be the causes of the poverty, the fact that those who had low status didn't seem to deserve it. He came away calling for a revolution, a revolution in a class structure. This wasn't to be a violent revolution. He said there wasn't to be red flags and street fighting. But what he wanted, in his words, was a fundamental shift in power towards those in the society who deserve it. Things have largely gone George Orwell's way. Whatever the differences between politicians on left and right, what they're all agreed on is the priority to get a true meritocracy up and running. They may differ about their views on how to do this, but they're all agreed on its central importance. If you come to Wigan today and visit one of its biggest comprehensives, Kingsdown School, you'll find Orwell's ideas for a meritocracy being put into action. League table came out, right? And once again, uh, we're at the top, the top of the tree. I think we've been there all year. 
I think you have. I, I don't think there's been any, any point at which we've, uh, we've fallen off this top position, but there's still a couple of months left in school where we can be caught up if we let our standards drop. Right, we don't want to come second, but we need to make sure that we finish at the top. The school was in decline when I first came because attendance was low and morale was pretty low too. Um, and I think the people in the community didn't have a, a very good image of the school really uh, and didn't have an awful lot of confidence in the school and things were a bit depressed. So what did you start doing as soon as you came here? Well, we, what we really had to do was, was raise morale really and build self-esteem and those were the key things to do. To uh, make sure that the young people felt valued and that the school was somewhere where they felt that they could succeed. So we took, as our motto, your opportunity to succeed. Can we give those people a round of applause? Three years ago, 10% of the students who left this school left with nothing, no, no qualifications at all. Last year, every single student left here with four GCSEs, and 96% had five. Now, that's an astonishing improvement. And then there was a 400% increase in students gaining five or more GCSEs at higher grade passes. They have made tremendous strides forward. The benefits of a meritocratic system have been extraordinary. People who for generations were held down within a caste-like hierarchy have finally been allowed to fulfill themselves in whatever way their talents allow. Race, class, gender, age, all of these have stopped being obstacles to advancement. An element of justice has entered into the distribution of rewards. Alongside meritocratic educational reform has come efforts to promote equal opportunities in the workplace. We're repeatedly told that through effort and diligence, we can make it to the top. This is Chilwood, a factory in Wigan that produces toiletries, packaging, and over 400 sanitary towels a second. I think anybody who really decides that they're going to go for it the opportunities may not be in the exact job or position that they, they're currently occupying, but there will be opportunities round the corner almost. It, it, it happens, we've got good examples of it here, people who work hard and go for it will be recognised because we aren't over brimming with talent, but you know, you find it, you've got to use it and it happens. There's no doubt at all, it happens. I started with Chilwood in 1986 as a service person which was for a three-month trial basis. Uh, during that period, an opportunity came available uh, within our SAMPRO division, which I applied for as a service person in that department, more permanent position. Uh, I was successful in achieving that position. I then moved on within SAMPRO to become a line operative and then a number one operative. About 1994, I was asked to go on to our cling film department of our retail food wraps. I was then offered a position of senior supervisor within our retail foil division. Following that, a position became available in 1998 for a production manager within our personal care department. I was then offered my present position, which is a manufacturing manager. So I've worked my way through the factor from right at the bottom, through every department, up to where I am now. There's a pride in the way that many people now speak about how they got to the top. A pride that would have been impossible in the days before meritocracy, when you only got places because of who your parents were. Earning good money and having an important job title indicate more positive things about you than they ever used to. But unfortunately, in a meritocracy, having no money and no impressive job title also say many more things about you than they ever used to. I don't enjoy it at all, tell you the truth. Um, I find it very monotonous, very boring, unrewarding. There's, there's no challenge in the job. It's the same thing day in, day out. You just get used to this routine and you come in, do the same job you did yesterday and it's the same thing the day after. And uh, I've had enough of it, in all honesty. 
Meritocracy is something I'd like to believe in. But from, a, from where I am, from my position in life, it's, it's hard to grasp. It's not something I see day in, day out around me. Um, it's a struggle, really, in this environment to try and rise. Um, you feel like you're banging your head against the wall sometimes. There's a darker side to meritocracy. If the successful merit their success, it necessarily follows that the unsuccessful have to merit their failure. In a meritocratic age, an element of justice seems to enter into the distribution of success as well as failure. Financial failure becomes associated with a sense of shame that the unsuccessful of old had thankfully been spared. Now the question of why, if one's in any way clever, able or good, you're still unsuccessful becomes far more difficult as a question for those of low status to have to answer. The rich at the same time come to seem as though they're deserving of what's going right for them. And this radically undermines the plausibility of a lot of left-wing socialist thinking based as it was on the idea that the rich are essentially thieving, plundering bastards. <laughs> For a flavour of left-wing disaffection and a pint of ale, I've come to a meeting of the Socialist Alliance of Wigan, who meet every week to hear a band and plan the revolution. To them, ideas of meritocracy are little more than pernicious lies. It seems to me that there's a kind of interesting, potentially sad conflict between the idea of meritocracy and the ideas of the left. A lot of left-wing thinking has been based on the idea that those on the top are somehow there because they've robbed someone, they've exploited someone, uh, or they've generally behaved in unethical ways. It's fairly clear, right? So, so there's a kind of conflict between meritocracy and the left. And I just want to raise that with you. How do you read that conflict? What does that make you think? There is no meritocracy in this country. What there is is an illusion. The illusion that people can actually get on the world, they can get bigger cars, they can get bigger houses. And it's like chasing a dream. Now, as socialists, we would say that um, in, in any society, any society, those that rule society, rule society and maintain their rule by a combination of force and fraud. I mean, force being... And what's the fraud? Well, obviously the force is the police and, and bunk it. Yeah. But the fraud, the yeah. fraud is the idea that somehow you can get to the top. And that's so you, a fraud. So you think in our current society yeah. you can be clever, energetic and diligent and you will not get to the top? Yes, that's right. Well, the illusion is that actually you can get somewhere. Actually, you can get somewhere, you can get a nice house, you can get a nice car, and you can get all those things. And it's true that people do get those things, but they get them on the basis of debt. They get them on the basis of insecurity. We all want to improve the quality of our lives. But what we find is, is that the nature of the society we live in militates against the majority doing that. Socialism used to console by telling us that we personally were off the hook for low status. But the argument has lost much of its force. Winners make their own luck, now runs the harsh modern line. Living in a meritocracy means living in a highly fluid society where we're no longer divided into lord and peasant, aristocrat and commoner, but where we're said to have a choice about what we want to make of our lives, whether to be a winner or a loser. If we fail in the struggle, we're likely to end up ashamed, angry, but significantly without anyone else to blame for our misfortune. And even if we succeed, we'll know that in these precarious times, our status is unlikely to remain safe for long. 
In so many fields, we're only now as good as our very last performance. So we've ended up with a curious paradox. Our wealthy, opportunity-filled societies have had the odd effect of hugely raising our levels of status anxiety. status today? Who do we all look up to? Whom do the newspapers favour with respectful profiles? Rich people. People who, through their own efforts and merit, have been successful in business, entertainment and the arts. People who make no secret of their achievements. This can seem a dispiriting state of affairs. It can seem shallow or unfair. But it's made all the worse because we often assume there's nothing that can be done to alter the ideals of our society. We tend to think it's natural that certain groups have high status, while others are marginalised. But in fact, it isn't inevitable at all. It's possible to imagine a world where there's been a radical redistribution of respect. Islington, North London. It's Sunday morning. People are getting up. Then they do that most routine of things. They buy the Sunday papers. It seems an innocent enough activity and a million miles from our anxieties about status. But in truth, such everyday sources of information contain a myriad of subtle and insidious messages about who in the world matters and who doesn't. It was Karl Marx who first brilliantly analysed the way that our values are being shaped without us realising, and he coined a useful word to describe the process, ideology. Marx defined an ideological statement as one that sells itself as being naturally true when it's in fact made up to uphold vested interests. We were, Marx thought, being bombarded by such statements all of the time. In Marx's eyes, it's largely those at the top of society who are responsible for disseminating ideological beliefs. So in a society where power is largely concentrated in the hands of aristocrats, the idea of being an aristocrat and inheriting money is seen as inherently noble. But in a society where those at the top are business people, entrepreneurs, the idea of making money in trade and business is seen as the leading noble idea. In Marx's words, the ruling ideas of every age are always the ideas of the ruling class. The sociologist Max Weber said, the ritual of reading the Sunday papers has replaced going to church. Taking his cue from Marx, Weber was suggesting that just as priests in pulpits used to be the main source of ideology, it was now the media. Ideological ideas would never rule if they were seen to rule too forcefully. The essence of ideology is that unless our political consciousness is developed, we'll simply fail to spot it. Ideology is released into society like a colourless, odourless gas. Take a random selection of articles in the Sunday papers. Articles about where to be seen in France this summer, how women can now look more beautiful for longer, why Filipinos make the most reliable domestic servants, how to find a promising country home, and why we can no longer rely on jobs for life, but how exciting flexible careers can be. No wonder if many of us finish reading the papers feeling a bit dispirited. We're being subtly rebuked for all the ways in which our life doesn't conform to the dominant status ideals. All the ways our career isn't as stellar, our house isn't as fashionable, our social diary isn't as packed. We may end up feeling as guilty for our failings as if we'd spent the morning being berated by a priest. Ideological ideas, said Marx, are phantoms formed in the human brain that keep prisoners in their cells without a need for bars.
Marx wasn't alone. Although the very idea of politics changing anything is out of fashion, it's worth remembering that many of the groups who have status today only do so because they fought for it politically. They wrote pamphlets, changed laws, organized strikes, lay down in front of tanks, and burnt their underwear in public. I caught the bus to Denmark Hill in South London. From 1842 until 1871, it was the home of the critic and writer John Ruskin, who fought a passionate campaign to raise the status and conditions of the British working class. Ruskin hated almost everything about the world that his mid-Victorian contemporaries were creating. He hated railways, Oxford Street, the sprawl of suburbia, Crystal Palace, but also smaller things like the invention of the fold-away umbrella and the telegram. But what he hated most of all were the values of his mid-Victorian contemporaries. He hated their obsession with wealth. He described them as the most wealth-obsessed people that have ever existed on the face of the earth. The ruling goddess of the age could very well be described as the goddess of getting on, he wrote bitterly. Ruskin believed that the Industrial Revolution and the wealth it was producing had warped the values of his contemporaries. The modern haste to be rich, he said, was condemning the workers to life in a labyrinth of black walls and loathsome passages, a life of filthy slums, polluted air, and dangerous, stinking factories. Most educated Victorian opinion believed there wasn't much that could be done about such degradation, that it was just the inevitable, natural outcome of the laws of economics. Ruskin would have none of it. He demanded free education, decent housing, and access to green space for everyone. And most of all, he challenged the central idea of his age, the idea that there was something admirable about being rich. Ruskin too was desperate to be wealthy, but he had a very different idea of wealth in mind. What he wanted was not money, he wanted kindness, intelligence, sensitivity, godliness, a set of virtues he referred to simply as life. There is no true wealth, he wrote, but life. That country is wealthiest which nourishes the greatest number of happy and noble human beings. Most of those people commonly considered wealthy are in truth no more wealthy than the locks of their strong boxes. Ruskin made a difference. He set in train many of the arguments that were to lead to the creation of the welfare state. He remains an inspiring example of how, by making a lot of noise, by acting politically, a person can start to alter the values of his world. In 1906, six years after Ruskin's death, 27 Labour MPs entered Parliament for the first time. And when they were asked who was the person who'd most influenced them to pursue politics, 17 of them answered that it was John Ruskin. Mahatma Gandhi, for his part, said that John Ruskin had been the single greatest influence in his life. Potter's International Hotel, off the A323 near Farnborough, Hampshire. The every woman, women in business lunch. In low-ceilinged rooms, business women are picking at salads. Are you all in business? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. What, what business are you in? Well, we have a wonderful new business. It's called Glass Suckers. Uh -huh. What's that? It's, um, <laughs> it's decoration on your glasses. On your glasses? With a miniature suction cup. This is not an event to set the world alight. But stop and think about it for a minute. Less than 100 years ago, this gathering would have been literally inconceivable. There weren't any women in business at all. This particular route to status and respect was blocked to them. And the fact that things have changed so much is down in large part to political agitation. Women being able to open a bank account in their own right was only 30 years ago. Even the women here, they wouldn't have believed 20 years ago that they would be here. 
people listen to you more if you're running a business that's successful you're employing people suddenly people will sit up and listen to you political response to status has been to insist that our contemporary status ideals are not inevitable, but man-made, and so they can be changed. I'm going in search of people who've learned to live by different ideals. Jill and Tony Worley and their friends Anne and Peter Simpson are going away for a weekend in the country. They find the packing much less stressful than most of us do. That's because they won't be wearing anything when they get there. Through those gates and all the stress drops off you and it's just a nice place to be and it's a very sensible way of being. So. You just forget everything else about yeah. the rest of the world. When I was working I could never wait to get home and take all my clothes off, in the right weather of course. <laughs> <laughs> yes. What do you think of textiles, people who keep their clothes on? What, why do you think they do keep their clothes on? I think perhaps they're scared if they shed their clothing they're shedding the thing that they feel protective. I, um, I've got a uniform, I'm a policeman. My uniform protects me. I'm an airline pilot, I've got my uniform, it protects me. If I take it off, who am I? And it's more or less a code between nature that you don't talk about people's jobs. You, don't, right. you don't ask for their surnames and you don't ask what sort of job they do. <laughs> Aztec's Sun and Recreation Club in East Grinstead stands in a long tradition. From the start of the 19th century onwards, a new group of people began to be noticed in the West. They often dressed simply, they didn't much care about money or convention, and they came to be described as bohemian. There have been all kinds of bohemian movements in the last 200 years. The romantics, the surrealists, the dadaists, the punks, the hippies, and of course the naturists. And there's perhaps one thread uniting all of these very disparate movements, and that is a decision to stand outside of the bourgeois mainstream and live for a set of new independent values. Being naturist, does that give you a different perspective on the way that people outside of the naturist community use their clothes to maybe show off or bolster up their position? Yeah, the designer labels. labels yes. People Everybody. who we meet who wear the, the fancy labels. Yes, it's done for show, look what I've got, because I've got I'm shopping money. in the right shops. Yes. And their little carrier bags, what they've bought it in. But you feel outside of all that? We, we, we've placed ourselves outside of that. We go to the cheapest place because we have to wear clothing, and clothing is what we wear. Bohemians don't necessarily set out to abolish status altogether, merely to insist that it be distributed according to their own rules. Once you're in the club, do you feel that there are still differences in people's status? Yes. Yeah. Well, you I mean, see, you look at the caravans, caravans around and... Is it, is it, is it size people, that matters? It, it is in caravans. And yes. Yes, yeah, <laughs> caravans, it really is size. We're only ten yeah. people, so... Bohemians pose an important question for all of us. Who are we going to get to judge us? Whose opinions should we give weight to? we can learn from the Bohemians that status is available from a variety of sources. Above all, from our friends. Our choice of audience can be our own. Charleston in Sussex is a temple to British Bohemianism. It was the home of the painter Vanessa Bell, sister of the writer Virginia Woolf. Here in the 1920s and 30s, Vanessa Bell and her friends, the Bloomsbury Group, started an experiment in living whose effects we're all still feeling today. Vanessa Bell's granddaughter, Virginia Nicholson, showed me around. Virginia, there's an amazing atmosphere in this house. It feels so sort of relaxed and, dare I say, bohemian. Of course, this is where 
I remember everyone having dinner and, and, and meals, and there was a, a great sense of conviviality here. What sort of subjects of conversation with people? That's uh, a hard then. one. Life, <laughs> art, gossip, sex. you know, sex. Uh, who'd taken to the bottle, who'd uh, had a letter from so-and-so. Um, but it's all very kind of handmade, is it hand-painted? Absolutely. I mean, shade. I always love the lampshade because it's like an upside-down colander and completely makeshift. Uh, they didn't bother too much with having things properly made. Because it's not expensive, is it? Oh, no, like no, no. They it's never had money. much money. This is not an elite of people who were living a grand way of life at all. It's just people in a rented farmhouse in the countryside. You know, just letting rip a little bit. The place was wide open. You could do anything. Um, you, you feel more creative just well, you walking around. Well, it was these messy. Ways. You know, and that was rather Nicely nice. Messy. Nicely messy, and and that was a way of life here. Being a bohemian isn't about having a certain kind of job, income, or even house. It's about a way of looking at the world. In the words of the children's writer Arthur Ransom, Bohemia isn't a place; it's a state of mind. And what that state of mind boils down to is a spirit of independence and freedom, a commitment to live by your own values. core values were about living for art and rejecting materialism, rejecting the bourgeoisie, rejecting everything that they saw the bourgeoisie as standing for. They believed in truth, didn't they? The, these ideas of true living, true loving, and a great questioning of everything. Why can't we do things differently? Why can't we have different kinds of sexual relationships? Uh, why can't we paint our houses in different colours? Why can't we dress differently? So it is about breaking rules and, uh, and giving themselves a, a sense of validation, in a way, by doing that. of the cheering things about Bohemia that people who set out simply to live as they choose often end up winning greater freedom for everyone. Many of the freedoms we now take for granted, to talk to who we like, to have relationships with who we like, not to have to wear a hat in public, even to put garlic in our food, were first established in Bohemia. Experimentation was of the essence here. I mean, you can go from everything to the, the simple infidelity, to the menage à trois, to the menage à quatre, to the commune, and points beyond. And I think that that, that generation broke through a lot of barriers which we ought to be grateful for. In a curious way, we're all bohemians now. The bohemian attitude has one serious drawback. It can easily spiral off into willful eccentricity. Are you taking it for a walk? Yeah, I'm taking it for a walk. It's a new kind of pet. In 1850, the French poet Gérard de Nerval ceased conforming to bourgeois ideas of suitable pets and acquired a lobster, which he led around Paris on the end of a blue ribbon. Oh my God, is that real? Yeah, it's a lobster. Oh, Nicky, don't touch it. It's called Augustus. See? It's sweet, isn't it? Why should a lobster be any more ridiculous than a dog? Nerval questioned. They're peaceful, serious creatures. They know the secrets of the sea, and they don't bark. Whatever the eccentricities of certain bohemians, the bohemian movement's enduring contribution has been to stand up for an alternative way of life. It has lent dignity and seriousness to a set of values overlooked by the bourgeois mainstream. Like Christianity, of which it was in many ways a secular replacement, appearing at just the time when Christianity was beginning to lose its grip on the imagination of people. 
Bohemia stood up for a spiritual as opposed to a material way of evaluating ourselves and others. Come on. The whole idea of ownership is just so utterly vulgar. Why would one want to own anything? This is my car, big deal. It looks much like someone else's my car. Everyone's got a my, and what does it reflect? Nothing except, you know, what Volvo said you ought to have. They buy the lie. They do buy the lie of the new car every year, of the house that you have to own. I really feel that people have been robbed of life. I really do feel they've been robbed of the freedom of choice, the freedom of understanding and enjoying the world that we live in, in, in its infinite and finite beauty. People have been robbed and they've been sold this lie, hook, line and sinker. In the Essex countryside near Harlow, I found bohemian values alive and well. Penny Rambeau and G. Voucher are members of Crass, an anarcho-punk music and art collective they founded in the late 1970s. The door is never closed to anybody, you know. And Any, uh, anyone who comes to the door, you'll let them in. We, they will always be welcome, and uh, there is a, 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 you know, an unspoken understanding that you come to share, not to take. I mean, we have stra had strangers that come into the house and they've fallen asleep on the sofa. You think, well, that's incredible. They feel so safe, you know, and that, I think that's quite a, you know, I think that's a wonderful what? thing to happen, you know, and, mm. and you can be in the middle of just about to serve a meal up and maybe <clears> three or four people come through the door and it's like feeding the 5,000. It does stretch. It's not a problem. We grow a lot of food. We grow most of our food. We have a yeah. choice of maybe 10 vegetables in the winter and we have a, a choice of maybe 15 in the summer. So, I mean, yes, we're self-sufficient if you don't fancy other foods that sometimes you fancy, you know. And, it's not uh, so much a matter of, do, uh, of doing without as, as doing with. I mean, we naturally do without, you know, and so anything else, I mean, if G goes shopping or if I go shopping, we come back with, you know, chocolate biscuits, then that's, that is what, how other people would see being without, if you see what I mean, because it's actually, that's a special treat, you know, and we're all a little bit excited about Demolished it. Demolished in two minutes. Yes. <laughs> and, and so we've learned to live very, very simply, and one can live very, very simply, and it's to do with expectations. Do you think of yourself as a bohemian? I mean, does that word appeal to you? It appeals to me more than the other things that, that, that people like our selves are often defined as being. I mean, because I, I, I like the historical context of it. I mean, I think a bohemian essentially seeks an authenticity. There are many cynical people who, for example, they might watch you in the garden and say, oh, these are just two old hippies yeah, yeah. living in the country. What, yeah. what do you think about that attitude? I don't really mind at all what people think. That's their business, isn't it? I mean, I don't really care what people think. I don't, I'm not, it really does not concern me what other people think. So you really have, in a way, managed to completely <clears throat> uncouple yourself from concerns about status? I don't, I don't even understand. I mean, I, when I say I don't understand the meaning of the word, I mean, I understand it in the dictionary sense. You I just don't feel it. I don't, it's I not just, an emotion you recognise. I can't comprehend it. Penny and G have made real material sacrifices to live the way they do. But perhaps we don't need to starve ourselves of chocolate biscuits to gain something of their mental calm. I'm going to suggest some ways that we can all deal better with our anxieties about how well we're doing in life. Marcus Aurelius was Roman Emperor from 161 to 180 AD. 
As such, he was the man with the highest status on the planet. But he was also, unusually for people who rule the world, a philosopher. Marcus Aurelius stood in a long philosophical tradition of writing about status, one dating back to the ancient Greeks 600 years before him. And the enduring legacy of that tradition has been to insist that what you're worth has very little to do with what other people think of you. Marcus Aurelius wrote his great work of philosophy, The Meditations, whilst he was battling against bloodthirsty Germanic hordes on the furthest frontiers of his empire. Hi. Just do a quick health and safety, because they're very conscious here. Can we make sure that any pointy sharp things are on that side of the rope um, when we're back here? There was a disappointing turnout when I came to watch the Colchester Roman Society, but they went on undeterred. Marcus Aurelius would have been proud of them. As an emperor, his behavior would have been endlessly examined, praised by some, criticized by others but he was aware of how untrustworthy it all was. He wrote his meditations to remind himself to submit any views he heard about his character and achievements to his own reason before allowing them to affect his estimation of himself. My decency does not depend on the testimony of someone else. Will any man despise me? Let him see to it. But I will see to it that I may not be found doing or saying anything which deserves to be despised. Colchester Romans, like their most philosophical emperor, know better than to judge their own performance by the amount of applause they receive. Philosophy isn't saying that you're always admirable in everything that you do. Where it's really useful is in helping you to decide for yourself, by a process of logical thinking, how much justice lies in the world's assessment of you. Perhaps the most trenchant advocate of this tradition was the 19th century German philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer. He said, We will gradually become indifferent to what goes on in the minds of other people, when we acquire an adequate knowledge of the superficial nature of their thoughts, of the narrowness of their views, and of the number of their errors. Whoever attaches a lot of value to the opinions of others pays them too much honor. For the new transformation of the able representative is able cosmetics. This is the New Media Age Effectiveness Awards, a prestigious annual awards ceremony for the dot-com sector. Many of us work as much for the respect of our peers as for the money we earn. Schopenhauer urged us to beware. Schopenhauer believed that we're prone to chronically overrate the opinions of others. We don't stop to ask ourselves on what basis these opinions have been formed. If we did, we would often find that ideas of who is successful and who is a failure are based on nothing more than suspicion, rumor, and passion. There's a sense of, yes, it's been adjudicated and we've been voted the best in the country. And um, we're very, very pleased to get it. We're, we're over the moon. To actually get recognised by these really influential and prestigious people, it's just the most amazing feeling. It feels really surprisingly fantastic. Like there's some sort of justification in terms of what we're trying to do. Schopenhauer said, other people's heads are too wretched a place for true happiness to have its seat. Would a musician feel flattered by the loud applause of his audience, the philosopher asked, if it were known to him that it consisted entirely of deaf people? Schopenhauer's argument could be described as intelligent misanthropy. Its drawback is that we could end up like the philosopher himself did, with few friends living alone in a flat in Frankfurt with only a poodle for company but it also offers us a bracing antidote to our anxieties and vulnerability. The people whose good opinion we crave don't actually know us. 
So why let their verdicts govern what we make of ourselves? So what Schopenhauer urges us to do is to trust ourselves, to analyze ourselves rather than base our ideas on public opinion. What matters is not what we seem to the world, but what we in fact truly are. If politics sets out to change the way that status is distributed, and philosophy reminds us to be skeptical of other people's judgments about our standing and success, there is another, perhaps even more fundamental way of rethinking the whole subject, art. Artists traditionally had a very hierarchical sense of what and who is important, and that hierarchy has really been a reflection of the hierarchy outside the world of art. It's kings and queens who've come at the top. Uh, most portraits are of aristocrats uh, or of subjects from uh, antiquity, from the classics. But in the 17th century, we see something new appearing, that suddenly ordinary people are given some of the canvas. They're told that they too can be important. like Peter de Hoek behind me, a famous Dutch 17th century artist, we see that it can be an ordinary life that matters, that a woman tending her child, sweeping the yard or doing some laundry also has value and dignity. Within paintings like de Hoek's lies an implicit subversion of any vision of life that could dismiss as insignificant and valueless a woman's domestic care. True status, art like this argues, does not necessarily lie where society conventionally places it. Jamie Thraves has made a film called The Lowdown about drifting, insecure, inarticulate 20-somethings who can't decide what to do with their lives. Nothing very dramatic happens in it. But it reminded me of the message in art like De Hooks, that even ordinary lives and everyday events can be full of significance and are worthy of respectful attention. Sometimes I get depressed coming out of a cinema because I think that the lives that I've just seen portrayed have got nothing to do with my life at all. Uh -huh. Maybe they're much more glamorous, uh -huh. the ending is happier. The end of the lowdown, you don't think everyone's going to live happily ever after, and yet I think it does leave you feeling good because, for me at least, it shows me what real life is like and, um, as I say, it makes you feel kind of less alone with the messiness of what real life is like. Um... Um, yeah, well, um, and I think that that's the kind of thing I wanted to get across. I felt that, to me, um, that there's a huge chunk, chunks of, a chunk of life where nothing major happens. And I wanted to watch a character that's going through that period. Does that make sense? Yeah, but I don't think that many works of art, and this is kind of the problem with a lot of them, draw us away from those tiny moments and shift our attention to extraordinary events. So it's almost as though we kind of feel a bit embarrassed and lonely with our tiny moments, that most of our life is spent sort of sitting on a bed with your girlfriend, umming and erring. Mm. But yet films tend to teach us that that's not where the action is, that's not what's interesting. Um, yeah, I guess, I mean, I, I just think there's, there's, I was, I was saying this, you know, that the idea that when you lose your keys, um, in that moment that you lose them and you panic, I find that all the things that are wrong in my life all come to a head in that moment. And, uh, you know, someone's face is just constantly, constantly interesting, everyone's faces, isn't it? So I think that's... Um, I think if you're just pointing a camera at a face, you're always going to be getting something interesting. So I don't think you can go wrong, just... You don't have to leave your bedroom to make an interesting piece of drama. Where art is really useful is in helping us to deal with failure. Many of the greatest works of art are the stories of people who fail spectacularly in life. Our fear of failing at things, at losing our job or our status, perhaps wouldn't be so bad if it wasn't for an awareness of how harshly other people tend to judge failure. First story on the agenda today, right, Oedipus. Guy 
um, basically shags his mum and then cuts his eyes out and kills his dad. So it's an everyday tale. Nice. So we need a front page headline. Se I don't know. Sex with mum was blinded. Club foot love rat tops his dad. Tops his dad. <laughs> Club foot love rat tops his dad. Yeah, that's it. What we mind when we lose our status isn't just that we might have less money, it's also the way that other people are going to talk about us for having failed. And I think that's where art comes in. Many of the greatest tragedies of the Western tradition are stories of people who've lost their status, who've become, one way or another, losers. I visited the offices of the Daily Sport in Manchester. I wanted to see how a group of tabloid journalists would be inclined to interpret the harrowing stories of failure in some of the great works of world literature. Right, Othello, I'm in trouble because I thought that was an ice cream. Does so anyone know what Othello's about? Othello. He, he kills, he kills his lover in a, in a jealous uh, rage. His lover was male or female? Female. What no. was he jealous about? Uh, that she was um, sleeping with someone else. And what's she about? about? No. So uh, is that the full extent of the play, the whole three hours? Jealous uh, man kills girlfriend? That's the headline. Sick squaddy. Sicko squaddy. Sicko squaddy, Sicko squaddy. better, yeah. Sicko squaddy. Smothers. 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 What was the name of his bird? Love cheat. Sh Smothers mm. Shagapi. Squeeze. Yeah, yeah that's, lovely. That's, that. that's a bit 1950. Yeah, squeeze is a bit. Yeah, nice bit of alliteration, though. No? Desi. Mona. Desi. Sicko Squaddy Smothers Shagapi Mona. There we go. That's cool, that's a winner, that. <laughs> and then uh, Madame Bovary. Go on, fill us in. In a small French town, uh, un unhappily married to local doctor, yeah. she uh, takes, uh, she starts having an affair with a younger guy, a young student. Right. Uh, she starts running up debt, huge debts. Right. She can't repay the debts. She can't tell her husband about it. She's in despair. Her, her lover lets her down. She commits suicide with arsenic, yeah. and dies That's shortly after leaving a distraught though. husband and little daughter, two-year-old daughter. Slimy frog in bizarre love trap. <laughs> <laughs> nice. If there's something incongruous about these headlines, it's because we're used to thinking of the subjects they refer to as inherently complex, naturally deserving of a respectful attitude rather than a prurient and damning one. There's nothing about many of the characters that we find in art that makes them inevitable objects of concern and even pity. If we do end up thinking of them as noble and dignified, it all has to do with the way that they're portrayed on the stage or on a page. It's the achievement of many artists to lend to people who could be described as losers, emotional compulsive, suicides, murderers, a level of sympathy that's owed but rarely paid to every human. Greek historian Herodotus reports an interesting custom practiced by the Egyptians at their grandest social gatherings, feasts and picnics. When revelers were at their most exuberant, their thoughts focused on pleasure and power, servants would pass between the tables carrying skeletons on stretchers. The ritual was designed vividly to remind party-goers of their mortality. The anecdote intrigued me. It might seem unnecessarily grim to turn our thoughts to death, but doing so may in fact be one of the fastest ways to dispel any worries we might have about status. Nothing helps us as much to sort out our priorities in life. The effect of the thought of death can be to lead us towards whatever we most value, and at the same time, to encourage us to pay less attention to the views of other people, other people who will not, after all, have to do the dying for us. The prospect of our own extinction can lead us to take more seriously what we most value in our hearts.
the contemplation of death has a long history in Western art. Vanitas paintings were hugely popular in the 17th century. They were hung in domestic environments, often in studies or bedrooms. In this time, there were a lot of very wealthy individuals and a lot of people making a lot of money from trade. And so this newfound wealth made a new wealthy class who were buying these sort of paintings. The canvases feature a contrasting muddle of objects, symbols of frivolity and worldly glory. And among them are placed the two great symbols of death and the brevity of life, a skull and an hourglass. The uh, Latin inscription here, mors omnia vincit, death always wins. The purpose of these works was not to leave their owners depressed by the vanity of all things. Rather, it was to embolden them to find fault with specific aspects of their experience and to urge them to attend more seriously to the virtues of love, goodness, sincerity, humility, and kindness. So how much would this reminder of the worthlessness of money and, and riches, how much would something like this now uh, set you back? But this one here, um, in the gallery, we're asking uh, 50,000 pounds for it. It's a pity that powerful people today don't follow the example of their 17th century counterparts because they might find the thought of death rather stimulating. Above all, it brings authenticity to social life by removing from us many of the reasons for which society honors its members. For example, the capacity to throw dinner parties or to work effectively. In so doing, death reveals the fragility and so perhaps the worthlessness of the attentions we stand to gain through status. There may be no better way to clear the diary of engagements than to wonder who among our acquaintances would make the trip to the hospital bed. Mary Allen used to run the Royal Opera House. Now she spends most of her day gardening and trying to write a novel. Oh, no, I used to get up at five o'clock in the morning, leave the house at 5.30, get, down, get to my desk at six. Then I'd have three hours before anybody else turned up when I could do my reading and my thinking and my writing. Nine o'clock through till seven, I had meetings. And then at seven o'clock, I'd have to go out either to a performance or a dinner or some kind of function. Did you get a chance to look at the flowers? Occasionally, fleetingly, very, very fleetingly. But on the whole, what were you mostly taken up with? Um, just keeping the whole thing on the road. I remember in February 97 thinking, I can't carry on doing this much longer because I feel terribly empty. You know, what do I do with my life? I think about arts funding, arts politics, a bit of art if I'm lucky. I've got nothing else in my head. I've got nothing else I can talk about. In 1999, Mary was diagnosed with breast cancer. She quit the high-flying career that had meant so much to her. How did the thought of death change your values? I think it makes you reassess everything almost instantly and overnight. I think one of the most important things to me was realising that through all those years when I'd been at the Arts Council and the Royal Opera House, I'd hoped that my friends would wait and wouldn't mind the fact that I wasn't spending too much time with them, but I'd always assumed that time, if not infinite, there was a reasonable amount of it. And that one of the most important things for me then was to just, to just spend far more time and energy and make much more of a commitment to personal relationships. So that's my husband, my family, friendships. And what started to matter less? Oh, work. <laughs> work, work suddenly had the status of nothing but providing you with the money to live. Whereas before, what had it been for you? Oh, beforehand, I think it had been a means through which I could achieve all kinds of subsidiary objectives like feeling good about myself, uh, intellectual stimulus, in fact, all kinds of things that I could have provided for myself through other ways. As conditional love starts to seem less interesting, 
so too may many of the things we pursue in order to secure it. If wealth, esteem and power buy us the kind of love that will last only so long as our status holds, and yet if we're destined to end our lives defenseless and disheveled, then we have an unusually clear reason to concentrate our energies on the relationships which matter. Did your concerns about status diminish once you found out? They vanished. That you were vanished. Vanished. Oh, well, it's irrelevant, really. And all I can concentrate on, if I am to die in the next year or two, is travelling from now to that point and travelling through that experience. Um, it is the quality of my life that matters. Not what anybody else thinks about my life, but my experience of my life. And I don't think I'd ever before that really so firmly been clear that it was my experience of my life that counted, not what anybody else thought. Why do you think we so often need death to remind us of what's important in our lives? Partly because it's actually rather a sweat to get going on all of this. It's much easier just to carry on doing what you've always done. I've always wanted to write. And actually it would have been easier if when I lay on my deathbed I could have said, oh, I might have written. If I'd had time I could have written. Say on your deathbed where I tried but I wasn't terribly good. <laughs> it's much more challenging. Yeah. Contrary to what an optimistic mindset teaches us, everything will, in fact, turn out for the worst. We will die, our achievements will be forgotten, everything we have strived for will be ignored and perhaps mocked, and even our names will be stamped into the ground. Whatever our status, we're all fated to end up as that most democratic of substances, dust. There is no wealth, said John Ruskin, but life including all its powers of love, of joy, and of admiration. If there's something strangely calming in the idea that we're all going to die, it's perhaps because something within us instinctively recognizes how many of our worries are bound up with things that are, in the wider scheme, pretty petty concerns. To consider ourselves from the perspective of a thousand years from now, return to dust in a smashed vault, is to be granted a rare, soothing vision of our own insignificance. <laughs> <laughs>